All right. Well, I think we're, uh, yeah, we have one person. Uh, I don't always associate with her, but she is on her way. And uh, so we'll wait for, wait for her. That was sarcasm, by the way. Nobody was biting, they? Yeah. She is not late on her own will. It is partly just as much my fault as it is anyone else's. So I left early from the home to get things set up and left her with getting her kids. So, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Can I help you um, I tried, um, so, um, other, other than, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I tried calling Shirley, uh, tonight, um, I did get a hold of her, so, um, so my last update would have been what Jana had posted on our church's, uh, Facebook page, so, so yeah, I put it there, I didn't want to assign you a seat, so, <laughs> although I could have put you right here. We've already ascertained that his life is fault. Yes, I took the blame for you being late. So, well, I took part of the blame, and then Dennis, Dennis forced me to be real. Yeah, right? Basically. Right? Thank you. So. What was my excuse if I was late? Say that again. What was my excuse if I was late? I didn't have anybody to blame. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's when you're like, dear, tire. All right, um, let us get started here. So um, as we do each week, uh, let's read Matthew 28, uh, verses 18 through 20. It says that Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right. Uh, so we'll pick up where we left off last week. Uh, so last week, uh, we uh, had a session where we uh, kind of entitled it Putting It All Together or Being Intentional. And uh, the challenge for you uh, last week was to uh, be in prayer that the Lord would send you out into the harvest field uh, to go make disciples. And so for you to pray, Lord, as, uh, as I get ready to head out in the harvest field, who's that person that you're putting on my heart? Or uh, maybe it's a couple of people. Um, but who are those people that you're calling me to invest in? And then for you to pray and discern, where is that person at spiritually? And then based on that, how is the Lord calling me to go, uh, to, uh, to get involved in their life, uh, to, uh, to open up doors to share the gospel? And so what we want you to do with this first part is to um, get together with your table and to uh, share what the Lord laid on your heart. Uh, if you missed last week and uh, you don't know, just uh, I would just back up a step and share with your group uh, who are some of the people that the Lord may be calling you to go to. So we'll back up a step for you and you can share that. And then this upcoming week, you could be praying that the Lord would help you discern which one of those uh, those several groups or several individuals that the Lord might be calling you to go specifically to. Okay, all right, so we'll take five minutes uh, for you to share that with your table. Thank you. 
share the gospel with others, uh, we should expect opposition. Um, as Jesus was teaching, um, we, we know that Jesus faced opposition uh, from uh, Jewish religious leaders about uh, what he was teaching. Um, and there are also times that the disciples opposed what Jesus was teaching or stood in the way of what Jesus was trying to accomplish. And so as we go share the gospel with others, 
Uh, we should expect that there would be opposition, that there would be objections uh, to the truth uh, statements we are trying to proclaim and share with them. And so uh, for the next four weeks, uh, we are going to be dealing with uh, common objections uh, to the gospel. And tonight we're going to start with, does God even exist? Uh, but before we do that, um, I have a list here, and I put three, but I, I actually added a fourth one, and I forgot to edit the document. So here are four important perspectives for us to keep in mind as we deal with objections from others. Uh, and this comes from crew.org, uh, so Campus Crusade. Uh, so God can and will use us regardless of what we know. And so as we go through this information over the next four weeks, I don't want us to fall into this uh, lie that, oh my gosh, there is either, um, there's so much more that I need to know in order to be able to answer these objections, or I need to dive deeper into this, or what about these other objections here that we didn't even cover in class? Like, clearly I'm not ready to share the gospel with someone. Um, that is not true. <laughs> and perfect example, uh, we've talked about it in our class, uh, the woman at the well. Uh, she, Jesus shared the good news with her, and she immediately went and shared uh, the gospel with the village, shared about who Jesus was. And so, uh, there wasn't this long training that she went through, and she was able to answer any objection that Samaritans would have about Jesus. Uh, she just went and shared the gospel. And so God can use us uh, regardless of what we know. Secondly, um, as people raise objections, there is nothing wrong with telling someone. That's a great question. I do not know that. Uh, can I go look that up? Or can I research that? Do you mind if I go research that more? and then we'll meet up again. Um, if anything, that gives you the opportunity, <laughs> that the reason to schedule another time with them. It gives you a second opportunity to share uh, the gospel with them. And I believe that actually gives you more credibility than uh, the times that we try to just make up an answer or to give a weak answer. So there's nothing wrong with responding with, um, that is a great question, can I think about it and get back to you? A uh, third, Every other religion or belief system struggles to answer, adequately answer the basic questions of the origin of the universe, of uh, what our purpose is in life, and what the moral law is. In other words, as people raise objections to us and say, hey, I don't believe that, or uh, that's a pretty bold statement you're making about who Jesus is, or that God created the world uh, in seven days, uh, realize that the person we're sharing the gospel with has holes in their belief system as well. And so uh, part of what we're going to be talking about tonight is not only why should Christians, why should others uh, believe that God exists, but questions to ask atheists and agnostics in regards to their belief system as well. And so encouraging them to think about uh, how they would answer these same questions that they, they think we have weak beliefs on. Okay, and like I said, that'll become more clear as we go through this lesson tonight. And then fourth, we must remember that we are not merely responding to a position, but rather attempting to persuade a person. So our goal is not to win the argument, but to lead people toward faith in Jesus. Uh, how many of you guys ever watch like uh, any kind of law shows on TV or uh, seen a movie where like a lawyer gives uh, states a case? So the lawyer's goal in that is to win the argument convincingly. Okay, and so they are trying to really drive uh, their points home, really, really go for the win in that case, to make it absolutely convincing. All right, and it doesn't matter if they make the other lawyer look bad, it doesn't make, matter if they make the other, you know, the defendant or whoever look bad, they are trying to win the case, okay? We are not trying to win an argument as we share the gospel with uh, atheists and agnostics and any other non-believer. We are trying to lead them to Christ. And there is a huge difference between the two. There's a huge difference uh, in our approach. There's a huge difference in our mindset. There's a huge difference in our language uh, as we do that. Uh, if we humiliate the other person, it may be very possible that we defeat their arguments, but they don't want to trust in Christ because we have not been loving towards them. And they're like, well, I believe that God exists. I don't want to follow him because this person who claims to be a follower of him is a jerk. And uh, so, you know, it's it, now I believe God exists. It's really hard for me to believe that he's a loving God because of how you're acting towards me. Okay. So we don't want to have that result whatsoever. And so again, our goal is to lead people toward faith in Jesus, not just uh, not to win an argument. Okay. 
So uh, real quickly, uh, we'll come together. Uh, we'll spend a little bit more time in groups answering this question uh, with just probably a couple minutes. Uh, so as you share the gospel with non-believers, which of these four perspectives will be hardest for you to keep in mind? Again, as you share the gospel with non-believers, which of these four perspectives will be hardest for you to keep in mind? Okay. Okay. Um, well, one of the more common objections as we seek to share the gospel with atheists and agnostics is whether God even exists. And so a lot of your other religions uh, have this belief that, that God exists. It's just a matter of who that God is. But atheists and agnostics uh, often question whether God exists. And another typo here, I tried to fix the sentence. I didn't go back far enough. So it should read, atheists believe there is no God. And agnostics believe we cannot know whether God exists or not. Uh, to those who are most skeptical, it will be quite hard, if not impossible, to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that God exists. However, uh, my apologetics professor taught us that uh, neither can atheists and agnostics, agnostics prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Big Bang Theory happened or that macroevolution happened. Uh, those things are called theories and not laws for a reason, because there's not conclusive proof uh, to move it from a theory to a law. And so therefore, uh, our professor encouraged us to see the goal as not to prove that God exists, but to prove, uh, to rather show that the existence of God better explains life's complicated questions when compared to certain scientific theories. 
Okay, so if uh, if you know this is uh, proof beyond doubt, what our professor was saying, hey, it's going to be really hard for you to approach that line uh, with someone who is atheist or agnostic. And so if this is their level of of so-called proof that Big Bang Theory happened. What we want to try and do is to get up to here, you know, to, to rise above, to show more evidence that uh, that it is, uh, it, it's more reasonable that God exists, so he's the answer to uh, the questions of life's origins and our purpose here in life, okay? So we're just trying to show in the end, to an atheist, to an agnostic, it is more reasonable to believe that God exists than to believe that the Big Bang happened. Or it is more reasonable to believe uh, that God is the one who gives us our moral uh, law that is written in our hearts than it is that those things just happen to evolve over time. It is more plausible, um, as we'll get into, that uh, Jesus really was raised from the dead by God instead of uh, some other theory that they may uh, posit that, uh, that those events happen. Okay, so that's our goal, uh, to show that uh, Christianity and its claims are more reasonable, more plausible than scientific, uh, or it, what an atheist or agnostic would uh, give for explanations for that. Okay, so we're going to talk through five reasons, um, or talk through five areas uh, as to, or five reasons as to why it is more plausible that God exists than it is that he does not. And these are uh, from, if you guys have ever heard of William Lane Craig, uh, he um, has, he's a leading Christian apologist, uh, so he defends uh, the faith, and he wrote a book called Reasonable Faith. I'm not sure, I didn't check with Lori to see if we have that book in our library or not, um, but uh, if you like philosophy and like apologetics, it is one of the best books out there on the topic, but it is a little bit of a heavy read. So um, you often don't get into philosophy and apologetics and find a really light, easy read. So, um, so be forewarned. But it is a really great book. Okay, so reason one, God makes sense of the origin of the universe. Okay, so uh, or God makes more sense for the origin of the universe when compared to uh, what an atheist or agnostic would believe. So more and more scientific research that is coming out is showing that there, the universe does have a definite beginning. Um, so for a long time, scientists believed that the universe was eternal, uh, that it never had a beginning. More and more scientists, in fact, I mean, an overwhelming majority now believe that the universe did have a beginning. And the reason why that's important is uh, because most everything, if not everything, that has a beginning, so universe created, and for the sake of argument, it doesn't really matter what that time is. So Christians would argue that that maybe happened several thousand years ago, uh, scientists would say several million years ago, and there's kind of beliefs in between. That doesn't matter as much, and so don't spend all your time trying to already one way or the other. That doesn't matter as much. Uh, the more important thing is that uh, most everyone believes that the universe started at some point and then it has continued on, either for thousands of years, millions of years. Uh, but most everything that has started, there's a reason for it starting, all right? That it has a cause. Uh, there's a reason why it began to exist. And so that's the question that you always want to get an atheist or agnostic to answer is, why did the universe begin? Like, what caused the universe to begin? Um, and Christianity answers these questions in that the universe began because God created it. All right, we see that in Genesis. God created the world, um, and he did so for his glory. So that's the reason why. So the answer is how God created it. The answer of why is God created it for his glory. Uh, and then he created us so that we might know him and love him and be with him and praise him, all right? Furthermore, and <laughs> here's the warning. So this is the, the one time tonight we're gonna cross over into the philosophical realm, but whatever created the universe must be uncaused, must be timeless, and must be immaterial. And the reason for that is that whatever begins to exist, again, must have a cause. There must be a reason why this started 
unless you just want to argue it was by chance. But there must be a reason why it started, and so whatever created it must not have a cause. Okay? And at this moment was when time began. So whatever created this must be timeless. And uh, what's the third one? It must be immaterial because this is where material was created. And so whatever is created or whatever created or started the universe must be immaterial. And so you have to ask yourselves, well, what do we know of that is eternal, that is uh, timeless, and is immaterial? God. God answers all three of those questions. And that's the best answer, all right? Uh, that God created the world, that he is eternal, that he doesn't have a beginning. So he doesn't need to have a reason to be created because he wasn't, all right? So the best explanation that an atheist or agnostic can give to these answers is simply to say that the universe just popped up, all right? That it just began for no particular reason. Uh, we don't know how, it just started, okay? All of a sudden there's just this big bang for no reason and something was created out of nothing that had existed before, okay? And so as you engage with an atheist or an agnostic on these, this is why you need to ask the questions. Why do you think the universe began? All right, that's a huge question to ask them. Why do you think this, this began? And more than likely, they will have to answer it as for no apparent reason whatsoever, okay? And the moment they answer that, it's like, okay, you have no purpose whatsoever, all right? <laughs> if the universe just happened to come about by chance, there is no rhyme or reason for you to even exist. You have no purpose. But if God created the world, then you have a purpose because he gets to set what that purpose is. All right, other questions you can ask. How do you think the universe began? Um, so they might answer Big Bang Theory or whatever. Um, and then this is kind of the clinching question, not that they're guaranteed to, uh, to admit that, that you have a more reasonable explanation, but this is what you want to get to. Which do you think is more plausible? that God exists and that God created the world, God created the universe, he gave it a purpose, or that all of this stuff just happened randomly by chance, that something came from nothing. Which is more plausible, okay? So you always wanna be putting that question back on them, which is more plausible, um, okay? So that's the first one. Reason two, um, I promise these will get easier and less philosophical as we move along, okay? So reason two, on the sheet. God makes sense of the fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life. Okay. So whether or not you guys realize it, uh, there are several factors uh, needed for us to be able to live on this earth. Okay. So if the earth has to be a certain distance from the sun in order to support life here on earth, uh, that's why there's not life on Mercury and Venus and Mars and all the other planets because the earth has to be this perfect distance from the sun in order to support life. The moon has to be the perfect distance from the earth. If it was farther away or closer away, uh, the moon, remember, controls the tides, and so all the oceans would spell out over to the land and it would flood the earth, all right? So those are two. The tilt of the earth's axis uh, would completely alter all the temperatures on the earth. If it was tilted even a tenth of a degree, uh, more one way or the other. The amount of oxygen in the air, uh, the force of gravity, if the force of gravity was higher, uh, we would all, uh, none of us would be able to live. And so there are, there are several of these examples that are needed to be so precise in order to sustain life here on earth. And so Christians and non-Christians have to answer the question, why? <laughs> Like, how did all of those things come together to be so precise in the exact way that they are in order to sustain life, all right? Again, atheists and agnostics have to say it was just by some random chance. Um, all of these things, and, and I didn't, um, I couldn't find it, but like, I'll, and I'll try to find it at some point in time, but the probability, um, I think, uh, um, the case for a creator, it's in, it's in the case for a creator, uh, the actual probability, but the probability of all of these factors being true um, and having these dials on the precise um, 
way that they need to be in order to sustain life is just astronomically improbable. Um, the only way that is really probable is that we have a creator. Uh, we have a God who ordered things so precise in order to ensure that there is life here on the earth. Okay? And so, um, again, the question we ask our atheist and agnostic friend is, which is more reasonable explanation of the two? That all of these things happen by chance or that um, God exists and he turned these dials so precisely, uh, set the earth so uh, at the precise distance away from the sun and set the moon at the precise distance that it was needed away from uh, the earth and made sure that gravity had the exact force that was needed and that the oxygen on the earth is the exact amount of oxygen levels that we need, all of these things to ensure that we have life here on earth, okay? Reason three, God makes sense of the objective morals in the world. So uh, if God does not exist, then objective morals do not exist. Because for something to be objective, it must be right or wrong independently of whether anybody believes it to be so. Um, so let me give you an example. Uh, Pat, what color do you believe is the best color in the world? Yellow. Yellow. Okay. How many disagree with Pat? Okay. So... <laughs> So, in order for yellow to be objectively the best color in the world, what has to happen? Can we rely on humans to determine what the best color is in the world? No, because we're all going to disagree. And that's the case with um, so many stuff that we, if, how many, how many things in this world would you say, hey, humans, if humans decide what is right and wrong, they will all agree on it. I mean, there's, we argue about everything, okay? So there's, there's no objective truth that can be had just based on human decision and human belief, okay? We never come to a consensus on things. And so in order for there to be objective uh, morals in this world, we need something outside of ourselves to determine what is good and what is evil. And I put here a quote by a well-known atheist, J.L. Mackey, and he said, if there are objective values, then it makes the existence of God more probable than it would have been without them. So he's essentially saying, if objective morals exist, then that's a great case that God exists. And this is why many atheists today deny that there are objective morals, and instead argue that our current morality has evolved from biological and social evolution. But I put this, does anyone really believe that things such as rape and torture of the innocent and child abuse are only wrong because they are not socially advantageous or because they have become taboo. That's essentially what atheists and agnostics believe, is that eventually society figures this out, and when it becomes less advantageous to society, then society accepts that this is true. But they also lend to the possibility that sometime in the future, these things could become good again, that they're not always going to be objectively evil. And so they have to concede that at some point in time, under some circumstances, that potentially rape could be good for society, that torture of the innocent could be good for society, um, and that child abuse could be good for society. They can't argue that it will always be, those things will always be evil, because to do so is to state that there is an objective morality, um, there's an objective right and wrong. And once they concede that, then you get to ask the question, where does that come from? Because Again, it can't come from humans having a consensus on things. There has to be something outside of us that determines what is good and what is evil. And uh, sometimes I always hate to use the Hitler example because it's just the easy go-to thing. But there, um, most people, even though Hitler said, hey, it is okay to kill people uh, to take the lives of Jews uh, because they don't fit in with the perfect race. Um, that's essentially the type of society that atheists and agnostics have to concede could potentially happen if there is no objective moral reasoning. That you have to concede that Hitler says this is okay and this is good and this is just because there's no absolutes. There's no objective. There's no way that I can prove to Hitler that that is absolutely evil. Um, I have to just concede that, you know, Everyone kind of gets to choose what is good and what is not, okay? So, good questions to ask our atheist friends are, do you believe in objective morals? If they answer yes, 
Where do you think those come from? Again, uh, best answer is the ones that Christians have, that it comes from God, that God is good, that God is sovereign, that God did, uh, writes his, uh, his law on our hearts, and so we know what is good and what is evil. We don't always act in line with what is good and evil, but we know what is good and what is evil. And then if they answer no, then it, it, you ask them, when do you think that things such as rape, torture of the innocent, and child abuse are permissible? Because they have to concede that at some point in time, uh, some society may uh, believe that those things are true. Okay? Reason four. Uh, God makes the most sense of the historical facts concerning the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Um, so, while the truth of Jesus' resurrection is not widely accepted, uh, many New Testament scholars do agree on these historical facts being true. That there was an empty tomb, that it was discovered by women, and they did discover it on Sunday morning. Uh, they, New Testament scholars widely agree, and when I say New Testament scholars, I don't just mean Christian New Testament scholars. I mean non-Christian New Testament scholars. Anyone who has studied the New Testament as literature concedes these things. Um, on separate occasions, different individuals claim to have seen the risen Jesus. Um, so they're not saying that they did, but they're saying, hey, there are several people who claim they did, okay? And three, the disciples came to an agreement to believe in the resurrection. They told others about it, and they died for that belief when they had every reason not to. Okay, so they knew they were putting their lives on the line. They knew that the easy thing to do would be to just go back to their Jewish belief system and follow a different rabbi and uh, to believe traditional Jewish beliefs, but they did it. Okay, so they conceived those three truths. Jesus' tomb was empty. Uh, different individuals claimed to have seen the risen Jesus, and people gave up their lives uh, to follow Jesus and tell others about him. Okay, so those are established facts. So now, with our atheist and agnostic friends, we get to ask, what's the most plausible explanation for all those? What best explains those three truths being true? Okay? The Christian answer, again, God exists, God raised Jesus from the dead. That answers every single one. God exists, God raised Jesus from the dead. Um, most atheists and agnostics uh, may try to um, argue um, that the body was stolen or that Jesus really did not die on the cross, uh, but even most scholars uh, universally re uh, reject those. Um, and so then most atheists and agnostics then have to concede that there is no naturalistic explanation for the three events above, okay? So their, their answer is really, there is no answer. Uh, we don't know, all right? Whereas Christians are able to come back and say, God exists, God raised Jesus from the dead. So again, we go to our atheist and agnostic friends. How would you explain the three events above? Do you believe, which do you believe is more plausible uh, between the two, okay? And finally, uh, God can be immediately known and experienced, okay? So from a logic standpoint, um, this is probably the weakest of all of them, uh, but from a, a convincing standpoint, it could perhaps be the most convincing. Um, so we see evidence of God uh, existence in sunrises and sunsets. Uh, we see it in the size of the universe. We see it in the love of the mother uh, for a child. We see it in the care for the least of these. Uh, we see evidence uh, that God exists in the ways he answers prayers and how he has changed our lives uh, now that we have known him. Uh, remember, that was a huge part of our personal testimonies, is uh, taking the time to share with people, this is what God has done in my life. This is who he was. Uh, this is what Jesus did on the cross. This is how God has changed me. Um, it's an experience of God that lends itself, uh, especially when you have multiple people, uh, and in this case, millions upon millions, in fact, billions of Christians who have had similar experiences. And so being able to go to an atheist or agnostic and say, hey, this is who I was, this is who I am now, how do you explain that? Um, this is what I've seen happen in this person's life. How do you explain that? Um, you know, this person got in this huge car wreck and they survived. How, how do you explain that? I mean, just all these things that we see around us, all the ways that we see God work. How do you explain this um, in, based on your belief system? How do you explain this in a way um, where you're not just absolutely convinced that God exists? So 
I put here, in other words, each of us have several experiences in our lives to illustrate that as we draw near to God, he will draw near to us and make himself known to us. We see that in James 4, 8. And so consequently, we can draw on these experiences and ask our atheist or agnostic friends to give their most plausible explanation for it, or to invite our atheist or agnostic friends to draw near to God and make himself known to them. Okay, so you can uh, basically go back to where we were going to before. My best explanation for this is that God exists. How would you explain these things? Or you can simply say, hey, I believe that as we draw near to God, that he will draw near to us. And so I'm inviting you to, to draw near to God, to ask, to ask God to work in your life, to ask God to give you a sign that he truly exists, and for us to go forth in faith and say, hey, if that person does that sincerely, then God will show himself uh, to them, okay? So um, as we kind of wrap things up here, we went through five reasons. Um, don't go forth from here and say, oh, well, as long as I memorize these and rehearse these, it's a foolproof way to convince an atheist or agnostic to trust in Jesus, okay? It is not. Um, the enemy works in the lives of non-believers to blind them to the truth, all right? To make them deaf to the truth. And so uh, we need to realize that there are times we are gonna give really convincing arguments, we're gonna make the truth plain to them, and they're still gonna reject that. Um, that is Romans 1, 18 through 31, um, that uh, the truth about God, God has made it plain to them, uh, but they reject the God, and they worship uh, the created thing rather than the creator. Okay, so we still need to uh, rely and rest on God. We still need to trust him to open up their eyes, to open up their ears, to uh, open up their hearts, to receive God's word and the truth of who he is. But for the atheist or agnostic, um, these five reasons stacked together make quite the case for God's existence. Um, and so these are meant to work together. Okay, so you don't just pick your favorite one and then just go for it, because the whole argument in its entirety is either the universe came about by some random chance, and we have some random purpose, and all of this fine-tuning took place to make life happen by that small, 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 small mighty chance. And somehow we all came to an agreement on some of these fundamental truths of what is right and wrong. And somehow the tomb of Jesus is empty. And somehow all these disciples got together and were going to risk their lives. And somehow all of these, I'm trying to think what the, the second part of that. Um, yeah. Somehow, um, all these individuals claim to have seen the risen Jesus, and somehow all of these billions of Christians throughout history have these experiences of Jesus changing their life. Okay? So both atheists and agnostics would just say a lot of that is given up to chance, or there's some weak explanation that they would have for that. Okay? Whereas Christians just get to simply say, God exists. All those things are true because God exists. All right? Uh, William Ockham, he was a friar in the 13th and 14th century, and he said, the simplest explanation is often the best. Okay? How many of you guys have uh, ever noticed that when someone around you is lying? They lie and they give this really long explanation, whereas those people who tell the truth often have a really simple explanation for things. All right? And so... Uh, as you apply William Ockham's uh, theory to this, essentially you're going to the atheist or agnostic and say, you have to have this really <laughs> grand explanation for why all these things are true, or you can just admit that, that God exists. All right? And it again... It really takes more faith to believe exactly. that than yep. to believe yep. that God exists. Yep. And that's why we're saying, again, here's the proof beyond shadow... Of a doubt. Here's atheistic or agnostic. Again, we're just trying to show 
there is more evidence for this, that this is a more plausible explanation. There's more reason to believe this. And, and uh, these are just five reasons. Um, and I, I mean, as I took apologetics, I mean, there's tons more arguments out there. I mean, a lot more arguments out there for Christianity um, that we won't even have time to, to get into. But um, at the end of the day, um, when we, like so often, as we think through, as we engage with atheists or agnostics, uh, they put the argument in terms of there's all this evidence that the Big Bang Theory happened and uh, that there's macro evolution and uh, you know, all these other things. And then there's Christians who have faith, you know, that they don't really base that off any evidence. They just, they just faith, they have faith. They just have hope um, that, that Jesus is true. And really <laughs> the exact opposite uh, is true. There's all this overwhelming evidence that there is a creator, um, that God exists, that God is working in the world, that God has given us a purpose, that God raised Jesus from the dead, that God has saved Christians, and it is atheists who are really putting their faith um, in, in something that uh, does not have a, have a sure foundation. And so, again, uh, as we engage with atheists and agnostics, um, there are going to be times where it feels like we should be on, on the defense, but really the evidence is on our side. And we have to go in there with the confidence that, uh, that we actually know the truth, all right, and to do our best job in helping them to, to see the truth as well. Okay, um, so final question here to wrap up. Uh, we'll do this as one large group. So which of the above reasons for God existence do you find most convincing? So number five. Personal experience. Okay. Number two. I think that's a hard one to argue against. Yep. If I say, well, I know him, yep. I have a relationship with him, yep. you know, someone can't really say, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, it's the, the fine tuning of everything is mm. so blatantly clear that, yeah. Yep. My youth group leader back in the day took a like, <coughs> like regular watch, like the old kind, not the digital kind, but took it apart and said, put all the pieces in a bag and if you shake it up, that's like the chance of everything falling perfectly into place and it ticking and working. Mm -hmm. Like the details of life are that intricate, the little pieces of a watch would be put together and work. And like that has stuck with me and yep. it still sticks with me because anytime you think about the angle of the earth, I mean, I was talking about the sun and moon with our kids tonight on the way over and like, they get that day and night happens every day. <laughs> but yep. Like they don't get why, but like there's yep. so much detail to that. Like you can't even fathom all of the details of things. Yep. You know? Yep. Yep. I don't always go with the resurrection. Mm. I mean, the resurrection points to the centrality of Jesus Christ, focuses the conversation on mm. Jesus, mm. and that's the most important thing. Yep. There's, a, there's a, an Easter hymn that uh, says, you, you ask me how I know he lives, mm. he lives within my heart. Mm -hmm. That's not good enough for me. Mm. I mean, really is it. Uh, What's, what is good enough is that Jesus, the, the historical facts show Jesus rose from the grave. Yep. And in the end, the atheist or agnostic has to acknowledge what, what he or she is going to do with Jesus. Yep. 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 I think I've shared it before on, uh, in a Sunday sermon, and I've, um, I wanted to use it in another one, and I, I couldn't go back and couldn't figure out uh, where it was. But... Um, but yeah, uh, that there is actually more eyewitness testimony for the resurrection than any other historical fact. And I'm trying to think what the date is, but it's like it's like Middle Ages date. So, um, so like how all of us read history and we're like, all these wars happened, and we we believe the historical accounts of those, and then we get to the the resurrection of Jesus, and we're like, oh no, that you you need faith in order to believe that. 
uh, but there's actually more eyewitness testimony, more reason to believe the resurrection than any other historical fact. Uh, and like I said, it's before like the 12th or 13th century. Lee Strobel. It could be. Yep. Yep. Could be. In the cause of Christ. Could be. He find that out. Yep. Yep. Could be. So. Yep. Yeah, because we would need that because someone's not going to just accept that unless you have proof that you know, you know, that that is historically outside of the Bible. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think the scientific really, I, I'm with you because it's hard to argue with, against that. Mm -hmm. But for someone who has had no exposure to Christian thought even, um, and then you throw some of these things at them and it's a conspiracy theory because, oh, these people saw this, but, you know, I'm going yeah. conspiracy theories now. So without the Holy Spirit, none of these things yep. are going to have any impact. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, I do think science might. I mean, you, how do you argue against that? But some of these other things, that's just um, when you mentioned um, you would have no purpose. A lot of people believe that. No, I was born, I'm going to die, and that's the end yep. of it. I yep. have no purpose. Yep. Yep. So those things are really hard. With, I mean, without the Holy Spirit, you're going to get nowhere. Yep. You know? Yeah. And, and and I would say as as we're because this is a room where we can grab a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Um you said that number five might be the weakest. I don't think that that's the weakest. I think the weakest might be the moral objectivity, because particularly when you use Hitler or other things, there are people who say yeah. God was used to oppress and yeah. destroy yeah. and yeah. torture. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I really think that that's one of the that's mm. probably one of the more weakest. Yep. 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 Okay. Um, well, uh, if you have any other follow-up questions, uh, don't hesitate to to reach out. Um, but again, uh, and I like you guys have done a good job of, of bringing that up time and time again. Um, at the end of the day, um, yeah, I mean, we, we still absolutely need uh, God to work in a person's life. And let us be way more dependent on prayer uh, than what we do on uh, memorizing these arguments and, and making our case. Okay? So just trusting that um, at the end of the day, we, we need God to, uh, to open up their eyes. And if he does... Uh, <laughs> Our, our job is really simple at that point in time. Um, I mean, if they're, if they're ready, uh, you know, in, in some cases, we could just skip over all this stuff and we could just share the gospel with them and, and they'll put their trust in Jesus. So, uh, and if you come across someone who is ready to, to put their trust in Christ uh, and you find out that they're an atheist, don't go through all these arguments first, all right? Just, just jump straight to the gospel, okay? Uh, don't, uh, don't screw it up and then give them a reason not to. Not to uh, not to put their trust in Jesus, okay? All right. Uh, well, next week, um, we have one more week before Thanksgiving break. And so next week, uh, we'll deal with our second objection. And I'm pretty sure um, it has to do with the different religions. So it's uh, um, you know, basically, do, do all religions teach the same thing? Or is Jesus really the only way um, to, is he, is he really the way, the truth, the life? Or are there many paths uh, to heaven? And so... Um, that's a really common one uh, here in America. Um, you know, it, it's kind of our way of just, hey, you just keep your religion to yourself. Let me have mine because they're all going to lead the same direction. We don't have to fight. We can just uh, all get along. Okay. And so uh, how do we respond when someone uh, takes that stance on things? Okay. Uh, well, let me, um, the take home task, uh, if you were gone last week is to, uh, so it's the same task as last week. Uh, so if you finished it, um, then uh, you can rest well uh, this week. Continue to pray for God to, uh, to work in your life and to uh, reveal opportunities uh, to, uh, to share the gospel. Um, but if you were not here last week, uh, then be praying for workers, including yourself to be sent to the harvest field to make disciples. Uh, be praying uh, that God would help you identify who it is that uh, you are to disciple um, as you pray for discernment and then to assess where this person is spiritually and how you can go into their world. Okay, well, let's uh, pray for this time, and then uh, we'll uh, get in. Um, I'll, I'll
over and over again and then we'll uh, pray for each other. Okay. God, we thank you so much uh, for making your existence known to us, uh, that you've revealed yourself uh, to us, not just that you exist, uh, but that you love us um, and that you have sent your son Jesus to die for us. And we thank you so much uh, for uh, opening up our eyes to this truth, uh, Father, for opening up our hearts to this truth. Uh, and Father, may we never take credit for that. Uh, Father, may we always give you all the praise and all the glory uh, that you are worth, or that you are due, because uh, Father, that's all you. Uh, we thank you for the gift of faith you've given us, and uh, Father, we thank you that we get to gather here uh, now and to learn how to share this good news with others, and we pray that you would do that. Uh, Father, we pray that you would give us the courage uh, to share the gospel with atheists and agnostics. Uh, Father, I admit that so often this is one of the hardest groups uh, for me to, uh, to share uh, the good news of the gospel with, and so Father, I pray that as we know more um, as we see more evidence that, uh, that you exist and that you're good and that you love us, uh, Father, we pray that we would be all the more strengthened, uh, all the more encouraged to go share this good news with others. Uh, that, Father, we would, um, we would learn uh, these arguments, uh, but, Father, more importantly, we would rest on your power. Uh, we would rest on your ability to work through us, uh, that we would rest, uh, rely more on your spirit um, at work in us um, as we share the gospel. And Father, we pray uh, for hearts to change of atheists and agnostics in our life, uh, that you would open up their eyes to see the truth. Uh, you would open up their hearts to receive your love and your gift of your son, Jesus. Uh, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, let's move into group 